beginning a new series called Are We There Yet? Um, our family, when our children were small, and we lived in Jamestown, New York, had an annual Christmas tradition. Soon I would put the kids in the car and we would head across the Pennsylvania state line, which wasn't all that far from where we lived. And uh, we would go to this small resort area and they had a huge lobby and a giant tree and they had uh, these roaring fireplaces that were beautifully decorated and they had a nice restaurant with excellent food and so we would all dress up and go up to this place and, and take our pictures in front of all the decorations and, uh, and, and it would take about 40-45 minutes to drive there but that time of year, particularly if you live in the Jamestown area, you know you can get blizzard-like conditions. And I can vividly remember us packing the kids into the back, and Sue was one of those people that put whatever was needed in the car to survive whatever emergency could happen. And then she would sit in the front seat, and her posture would indicate that something bad was likely to happen any given moment. And of course, from the back of the car, we would hear the question, are you there yet? Are we there yet? And I would tell them yes. We're there, it's just going to take me a while to find a place to park. Um, are we there yet? It's, it's a common question, not just of children, but also of adults. Uh, often we feel like we've been waiting for something or working towards something for a really long time. And we just want to know, are we there yet? Or maybe there's been a lifelong hope or a dream or a goal and you're starting to doubt that it might occur. It feels like time is running out. Are we there yet? Or maybe there's a promise that you believe that God whispered to your heart. And you've not yet seen it fulfilled. You want to ask the question, are we there yet? By the way, it's not just good things that we ask that question about. Sometimes you can go through exhausting and draining seasons or challenges in life. And you would love for this thing to be over. Are we there yet? Well, uh, all the while we're in situations like that, it often feels like where we are or where we're going is a place we would like to avoid. And so this morning in this series of Are We There Yet, the first message in this series are go is going to be about not wanting to go someplace. I don't want to go there. And when you look at the life of Joseph and Mary, you discover they probably didn't want to go to Bethlehem either. Uh, both Mary and Joseph had said yes to God's divine invitation, and they wanted to participate in his redemptive plan, but that didn't mean that they understood what path it would take to get them there. So I actually think Joseph and Mary have a lot to teach us today, and we're just going to look at some of the insights of this Christmas story. It's in Luke, the second chapter, and it says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued, what's the next word? A decree. If you just circle the word decree, if you've uh, got your notes, uh, a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus was governor of Syria. And everyone, would you just put everyone, just circle that. Everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went, and the next word is up, and if you just circle that word. Small word, big meaning from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Um, I'd like to talk about what it looks like to be on a path towards the promises of God. And the path to seeing God's promises fulfilled in your life may require an uphill journey. It may require an uphill journey. We don't really coast into the blessings of God all that often. Joseph and Mary were making a trip to Bethlehem. 
This was not the kind of trip that they were looking forward to. First of all, from Nazareth to Bethlehem is a little over 90 miles. Secondly, is traveling in the ancient world was difficult, it was exhausting, it was uncomfortable, and it could be dangerous. And even if they wanted to go to Bethlehem, the timing couldn't be worse. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. So why are Joseph and Mary making this trip? Well, it was the result of a political decision to take a census. And the reason for taking a census is to raise taxes. That's right. Joseph and Mary are traveling to Bethlehem so that they can pay more taxes. And you thought your Christmas was going to be unhappy. On top of that, Mary is pregnant. And I'm not talking about the first trimester or the second trimester. I'm talking about the last five days of her pregnancy. And in that last week, she's going to have to make a 90-mile journey. And this is, this is the last part of this. When you go from Nazareth, you go by way into Jericho. And Jericho is the lowest spot on the face of the planet. The Dead Sea is near there, and at the, the Dead Sea is the lowest spot on the face of the planet. So to get to Bethlehem is an uphill journey all the way from Jericho to Bethlehem. Now, both Joseph and Mary had had visits from angels, and they knew that the baby that Mary was carrying was going to be a leader that would save the world. And you would think that this advanced knowledge of who Jesus would, was would have come along with some advanced information about where they were supposed to be. Because there was an ancient prophecy given 500 years previous to this. It's recorded by a prophet whose name was Micah. It's written in a book that bears his name. And this is what he said, that this great leader of God's people would be born in Bethlehem. Now, I do not believe that Joseph and Mary knew that they were supposed to be in Bethlehem because if they knew, I don't think they would have waited until the very last minute to go there. If they had known, they would have tried to get there a little bit sooner. So this is the worst time. It's an inconvenient journey. It's an uphill journey just to obey a tax law. And you can see why they would say, I don't want to go there. Uh, the second thing about the promises of God is that the path to seeing God's promises fulfilled in your life may require submission to authority. Submission to authority. There are some extraordinary uh, occasions in human history where human authority had to be defied and disobeyed because it violated God's direct authority. But in our culture, this is not common. We have a lot of freedoms. There is no law that says we cannot assemble together. We're not violating a law by being here. I'm not violating a law by preaching the gospel. You don't violate a law by reading scripture or by praying. We have a lot of freedoms, and so we actually don't have to stand in defiance of governmental authority in order to worship or even share our faith. But here's the thing I want you to see. For some people, they think that the government authority is always an obstacle to what God wants to do in our world. If God is so limited that he cannot accomplish his will in spite of human authority structures, what does that say about how powerful God really is? Don't you think that God is capable of using human authority to put the right people in the right place at the right time? You see, we often think, well, I believe that that could happen if the right people were in office. Caesar Augustus was not known as being your greatest leader in the world. And here's what I would like to challenge you with. If you think that God's will is thwarted because someone on the other side of the political aisle is sitting in positions of power, then I want to ask you, how small is your God that his will can be thwarted by a politician or a political system or a human organization and government structure? Don't you think that God can use that? Whose idea do you think it was for there to be a census? Oh, that had to be from the devil. <laughs> It got Joseph and Mary exactly where they needed to be, exactly when they needed to be there. It was God's will for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, so he used a census to get Joseph and Mary right where they needed to be. And here's what's fascinating. Joseph could have had an excuse. He could have said, 
I've got a pregnant wife who's in the last week of her pregnancy. I'm sorry, I can't go to Bethlehem. This is not good timing. Or he could have said, what difference does one person make in the census for the entire Roman Empire? This is absolutely silly. I am not going. His wife is pregnant. He's only one person, but he goes. It is possible that the reasons we give for not having to do something are the very things that keep us from being in the right place at the right time. Reluctance, defiance, noncompliance are not common tools in God's toolbox. We don't have to fight all authority in order to come under his. God is bigger than anything else we see in our world. So we have to learn how to give up a little bit of control. Just look at the person next to you, smile when you say it, and say, you've never been in control. Just tell them that. You've never been in control. It's all an illusion. Some of you enjoyed that more than you should have. So why, do, why do I point that out? Because here's what we often believe. We often believe that my life would be better and God's will be more likely to be accomplished if I could call more shots in my life. And here's what I want you to know. It is often true that you are in a season where you can't call any shots. If you've ever been through a significant health issue yourself or with a family member, it feels like you lose complete control. They tell you what doctor you have to see. They tell you what procedure you have to have. They tell you what test you have to take. They tell you what scan you're going to go through. You just feel like your calendar is being filled by other people who are routing you to all different kinds of people, and you feel absolutely out of control. In fact, that is as devastating to our emotions as the fact that we're facing a, a, a disease state or a health crisis. It's because we feel like we've lost control. And here's what I want you to know. Even if you feel like you're losing control in your life, it does not mean that God has lost control in your life. And you can submit to the authority structures around you and God will still get you exactly where he wants you to be at the exact right time to do exactly what he intends in your life. If I were you, that's where I would say amen. That's what I would do. Yeah. Uh, last point here. The path to seeing God's promise fulfilled in your life may lead to unlikely places. And by unlikely, I don't just mean unusual. I mean places that you would unlike if you could. Um, I have, I've been on some missions trips in my life to places that uh, has never been on a tourist uh, poster. I remember I was in one place, and I was, I was in this this remote village, the accommodations for staying was not great, and, and I can remember throughout the night, I would feel things in bed with me. I know, and, I, and when I would feel something, I would just go like that, and then I would turn on the light and see what I killed. It's true, and I started a line at the, at the end of the room of all the things I killed the entire week that I was there. I've got a picture somewhere. It's unbelievable. And, and, and I, I showed that to my wife, and I said, would you like to go there with me someday? And she said, I am never going there with you. <laughs> she said, I will pray for you. I will support you. I will wait for you. I will, I will love you when you get back, but I'm not going there with you. Now, not so long ago, I was actually asked to go on a missions trip to Mallorca, and Mallorca is a luxury island just off the coast of Spain where all the wealthy people in Europe go to vacation and where wealthy people build their estates. In fact, Rafael Nadal has an estate in Mallorca, this gorgeous island off the coast of Spain. And, and what there is, there's a church there, and they're building multiple campuses, and they asked if I would come in and do some leadership training for them. And my wife said, I'll go. <laughs> and all the council members said, I'll go. And if I was going to say, what do you say, the 930 service, we all just go to Mallorca. How many would be up for that? We'll try to get the 8 o'clock and the 11 o'clock service to pay for it. How's that? <laughs> just raise the funds that way. Unlikely places. It's an animal shelter. It doesn't look like heaven. It doesn't smell like heaven. It doesn't sound like heaven. But heaven was invading earth in that very spot on that very night in a feeding trough with a smelly shelter on a dark night 
light was beginning to dawn and the world was about to be changed forever because God can fulfill his promises even in the most unlikely places. We're tempted to believe that God's will is revealed by the opportunities that present themselves or the resources that are so available or the connections that just seem to show up. And all of those stories can be true. But sometimes God's will seems to happen where there's, where there's no opportunity and there's no resources and there's no connections. God still can fulfill his promises. Now, most people don't miss God's will because they refuse it. Most people miss God's will because they fail to recognize it. It didn't look like what they were expecting. So maybe you're in a season where you're headed into some things you would rather avoid. I mean, Christmas is a mixed bag, isn't it? We all have relatives that we'd rather not go to their house. We all have coworkers we'd rather not that they showed up at the party. We all have programs. God bless you. If, if it wasn't your kids that were playing those instruments, you wouldn't go. You know it. Especially when they're little, it's painful. It hurts. And, uh, and yet we love them and we go. And so there may be some things that you would rather not participate in. The thought of having to do some things may make you exhausted and anxious. And you don't want to go there because it's going to be an uphill journey. And it means you're not in control. And it might be a place you would prefer not to be. But maybe God has a promise to fulfill right there. Maybe he needs a person whose life is being transformed by grace to go to small places and dark places and broken places and busy places and hard places and pain-filled places because his grace is sufficient. And he can fulfill his promise anywhere. I can't imagine what it was like for that new father, Joseph, to stand there in the only place he could provide for his wife to give birth to her first child as an animal shelter, and the only crib he could provide was a feeding trough for animals. As unlikely and as unattractive as that might seem, and as it sounds, it's still the picture that all the artists paint, and it's still the song that all the songwriters write about. Heaven invaded earth. Light invaded darkness, and grace changed everything. So I don't know if you're there yet, but I know he is here now. And that is what makes the difference. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, I know that this time of year can be so hard on so many people. Maybe financially you're just strapped and, and just thinking about the demands economically that you're facing heading into this season just is overwhelming to you. Or maybe this season you'll be gathering around a table with one less person at it. And... You don't get to talk to someone, you get to look at their picture. Or maybe you're hiding information. You're waiting until the season is over before you tell your family because you don't want to ruin their Christmas. It can be a really tough season. And you might want it to be over and you might not want to go there. But I would just encourage you, even if you feel like you're not in control, don't be afraid to trust that God can still work his promise in all of it. And even if it feels like an exhausting uphill journey, maybe it's the one that is most needed for you to take. And even if it's in a most unlikely place, a place you would avoid if you could, maybe it's there that the grace of God will shine the brightest and the gifts of God will be their richest. And you wouldn't want to miss that. There's not a single person who participated in the Christmas story who wished they'd stayed home. Are we there yet? I don't know, but he is here now. And he has come to change our lives. Father, thank you. We're so grateful for your presence and grateful for your grace and grateful that even though it feels like we are in, out of control and and going in places we'd prefer not to go, that that is no way a barrier to you. 
that you walk into our lives, you walk with us in our lives, and you change our lives. Would you help us trust that you are doing that this Christmas season? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.